welcome the panelists, who also have the same kind of range and diversity uh, from uh, technology in one end to grassroots uh, entrepreneurship and working with uh, social entrepreneurs ac around the world. So we're very pleased and honored to have all of you today, this morning, to share your viewpoints with us uh, in the next hour or so. And uh, just before we start to, you know, to set a little context, uh, we, uh, you know, the Deshpande Foundation is now, this, uh, this is our 11th uh, development dialogue. And every year, uh, we have kind of moved the bar a little higher in terms of what the themes are, in terms of what our focus is. And a lot of it has been organic growth. As, as we have grown, we have seen the challenges that we and other sister organizations face. And we take this opportunity for people to reflect and think about those challenges and share it so that others can learn from it. So, you know, a few years back, we were talking about how do we kind of get together, take organizations, and scale them up. Uh, and then, you know, as we saw organizations in our uh, network grow and scale, the next thing we looked at was, okay, what do they need to scale? And one of the things that came up was, you know, we need to start building ecosystems. So we focused on ecosystems the last few times. But now we realize that if you look at the major challenges that we have around the world, you know, whether it's hunger, it's education, it's water, as we said, uh, it's not going to be one organization that's going to solve it. Uh, and most of the organizations that have reached that self-awareness realize that. And so that's what the team is for today's, uh, you know, this, uh, this year's conference, is collaborating for big bets. Because we realize if we want to be successful in really solving those problems, we got to look across boundaries, we got to look across organizations, and we need to really think about what do we build. And it is not just an ecosystem, it might be a mega ecosystem in some cases. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is, you know, we have a whole range of perspectives over here. Uh, and I would like to call on each one of them to share their own viewpoint uh, from their point of view, uh, whether it's technology, whether it's organization building, or whether it is uh, working in the social impact sector. In terms of you know, what they have seen, what their organizations have seen, how have they built scale themselves, and then what do they see uh, you know, as they grow uh, the opportunities to collaborate uh, around the world. Uh, so let me first, uh, you know, start maybe at this end uh, with Rajiv. Uh, Rajiv is, uh, you know, Rajiv is <coughs> with the, he's the founder uh, of Next in, uh, in Advisors and he has worked extensively in the retail sector with a number of uh, retail, uh, the Future Group uh, and so on. And so Rajiv, uh, you have sp spent some time thinking about this whole ecosystem issue and how do we build it. So maybe you can share a little bit about what you have seen, your perspectives as you've seen growth and as you've seen uh, s system scale, uh, you know, what, what do you think, uh, what works and what do you think should be done? Thank you, Raj. Uh, good morning. Um, well, I'm going to be looking at uh, ecosystems. I'm going to reflect on uh, three streams of work that I've been doing in recent years. OK, one is a fair amount of work uh, with entrepreneurs. And many of them are more uh, for-profit, uh, regular commercial uh, uh, startups. And uh, we've been working with many of them around scaling. Uh, some of the work has also been with uh, social enterprises, both for-profit and not-for-profit. And I'm also going to reflect on some of the work which we're doing at uh, Future Group around creating an open innovation program okay, for startups to work along with the company and see how, what are the learnings from such a program. And that program is about a year old. And third is just seeing the emergence of um, uh, online retail and other such business models over the last seven, eight years. And how have those models grown on the back of ecosystems? I would like to caveat that much of these may or may not be applicable to the development sector. So there would be some apologies in advance in case there might be certain things I might bring in from the other world which may not directly relate to the development area, though I hope that there are strong connections. I, I think there's always lessons learned. Yes. So, you know, I think uh, what we need to do is see what are the things that we can extract. Because I think one of the things that we always talk to our nonprofits and our NGO partners is that we need to get the best principles from the business world and apply it to the nonprofit sector. So there's always something we can learn. Absolutely. Now, when I look at the entire uh, thought around ecosystems, uh, and when we were discussing on the call before, when today when you look at uh, the organization of businesses 
we normally may use words like industries and value chains because they kind of define a certain unit of business organization. But now, if we start looking at the emerging business world, it's more businesses which are growing on the back of ecosystems, which don't particularly uh, fit a particular kind of form factor as a company or uh, any, any such kind of uh, legal units. And that makes things very exciting. At the same time, I mean, India has been a place where our businesses and ventures are already grown on the back of ecosystems, which have normally been business communities. I mean, traditional business communities for hundreds of years provided a lot of the mentoring resources and support for startup members of the community, such that no member so mortality okay, was increased purely because of lack of resources. So I think we are kind of getting back to some of those community-based models okay, which have been prevalent in, in our uh, uh, country for several years. So the first view on ecosystems is from an entrepreneur's point of view. And uh, Desh made a great point at Startup Dialogue that an entrepreneur has got two sets of resource requirements. The first is uh, the emotional support that is needed, and second is the technical support. Now, when you start looking at ecosystems, I mean, one is the availability of various mentors and role models okay, for entrepreneurs, whereby it's an extremely uh, lonely journey to be an entrepreneur. And you know that the others, OK, who've been there, who've done that, who've gone through the entire process, so you have all these reference points, OK, which you can use. And the technical support would be a lot around specific access to resources, not necessarily funding alone, OK, or certain connections to markets, et cetera. Now, India is supposed to be the third largest startup ecosystem in the world. So there's a certain assumption that a lot of those resources have automatically started emerging. But I think what has really happened is that we have a lot of startups but the resources around the startups are still evolving in any organized fashion. And as things stand today, whether you are a for-profit or not-for-profit startup, uh, uh, the entire aspect of creating an ecosystem is often a self-organized activity. Okay, it is dependent upon the entrepreneur to put his or her ecosystem together and, and figure out various dots and connect them. There are obviously certain models emerging on the back of uh, accelerators and incubators, etc. But it's still largely a very entrepreneur-driven process. So I've seen, uh, in case of many of the entrepreneurs that I've worked with, there are certain entrepreneurs who are very, very resourceful. I mean, resourcefulness is almost one of their primary identities. And they're very resource-conscious entrepreneurs. I mean, entrepreneurs often are very opportunity-conscious. They want to sell, they want to do stuff. But there would be certain entrepreneurs who want to do it all by themselves. But there are certain other entrepreneurs who either because they may not necessarily have either the right um, uh, alphabets in their educational background, an IIT or an IM, or they probably have a certain behavior of working with others, they, they, they kind of bring in some very interesting practices around resourcing. So one of them is to constantly look at people outside and see how to bring more well-wishers into their fold, connecting with their well-wishers. They are great storytellers because the currency an early stage entrepreneur is primarily got is a story and, and a connection to people outside. So to be able to craft a story, to be able to build their own ecosystem of well-wishers. These are entrepreneurs who create WhatsApp groups of well-wishers, keep them briefed every month. They have newsletters. So building your own personal ecosystem has been some of the things which has worked very well for entrepreneurs on this side. Great. Yeah. So uh, Rajiv, uh, so a couple of things that I got away. Uh, so one is, you know, uh, it's a lonely journey having an ecosystem around you. You either build it or, you know, if you had a support system, that really helps. Uh, the other one is, uh, you know, being able to tell your story, being able to kind of con c communicate. So as an individual, that's what really helps over there. Uh, let me, I'm not going to follow the traditional go left to right kind of thing. So I'm keep, keeping all the panelists on their feet. Okay. Uh, let, me, let, let me turn to Jacqueline. Uh, so Jacqueline, uh, you know, it's Jacqueline heads uh, the Acumen F Foundation. And you know, it's, uh, it's been working in the area of investing in social entrepreneurs India, I believe, was one of the first places you invested, uh, and I think it's one of the largest areas where you are currently invested. Uh, you see a lot around the world in terms of what's happening out there. Uh, you, have, you know, we have one of several of your fellows, I think, in the audience. Uh, given your perspective, you know, where where do you see India is right now, and where how does it fit into a global kind of ecosystem? of supporting, nurturing, scaling entrepreneurs, and how do we push them to the next level? Huh. Um, all in three minutes. Um, well, first, I just want to say that 
Uh, I think that being here at Development Dialogue and the work you've done, Raja, with Desh, Desh, with Desh Pandey Foundation is such an example of ecosystem building. And I think that in many ways, those of us who all got into this 10, 20, 30 years ago have followed a similar trajectory. And so it's been interesting for me to listen to the language shifting, particularly over the last decade, which is a completely different decade than anything we've seen before. Um, and Acumen's own trajectory has been like that. When we started, as you said, our thesis was that neither mar the market alone nor government or uh, the nonprofit sector alone could solve big problems of poverty. What was really needed was what we call patient capital, long-term investment capital, 10 to 15 year equity and loans in for-profit entities that were taking on these big problems. Um, and taken by itself, it's a major boost, but we soon discovered that capital is not enough. And so about six years in, we started investing not only in companies, but also in leaders. And now we've um, built about 500, uh, we've invested in about 500 young um, social entrepreneurs around the world, 100 of them in India, across a wide variety of um, activities. Um, and then we saw that one of the things that gets in the way of trying to build a market for this long-term patient investing is that we have not agreed as a world yet on what matters most to measure. And so we started to build out a whole system of what we call lean data, where we can take um, perspectives from the customers themselves and understand the impact of the investments that we're making. So now we have a common language and we're not only doing it for acumen investments and we've invested about 130 million in 120 companies but also for omidyar and diffid and rockefeller so that we're starting to build a real database where we can now look across one sector and i love that question about why aren't we diving down deep into a sector uh, take energy which i talked about yesterday and we not only can talk to companies about their financial performance, because that really matters for scale. But also we can say, you're doing really well on um, carbon displacement, but not as well in reaching the poor. Uh, your customers really don't like this piece of the work that you're doing. We can get really granular with them. And then we can share that across the ecosystem. One thing that Desh said that I don't fully agree with is when you build, have these gatherings across an ecosystem, don't take small and big together. And what, I've, what we've learned, uh, especially in India, is that we actually need to build the skill set of ecosystem building, and that includes learning how to work across small and big. And that corporations, and it's exciting to be with my corporate partners here, um, are getting more and more important because they are looking at sustainability, but it is really hard to make these work. And so um, we work with Unilever and Ikea, and we just had a gathering, many corporations, we just had a gathering in London where we brought together not just Acumen's ecosystem, but the broader ecosystem, including our big players, like I Ikea, like GE, like Shell, like uh, Unilever, um, with some of the startups, with some of the $10, $20 million companies, and the learning was extraordinary. The partnerships were incredible. The supply chain commitments afterwards, we are starting to see a real acceleration of that. Where India comes in, as I said yesterday, is that, um, and I think particularly in healthcare, um, to make this work, we've got to get razor thin margins to hit enormous volumes of people. And so um, what's thrilling to me is to see the models coming out in India for the world, and also um, the need to connect India even more to young people across the world. And so through our, so in addition to all of this, we then decided if we were really serious about ecosystem building, it was time to overlay this with a platform. So we've been putting the lessons that we've learned both in building companies and in supporting young social entrepreneurs online um, on our website through plus acumen, and we've had six lakh or 600,000, um, mostly young, but some old social entrepreneurs take these courses. They're starting to build companies in countries that we have nothing to do with. Um, some of those companies are, are hiring hundreds of people, and now we're connecting 
them to each other. And I just recently had a conversation with young social entrepreneurs from Sudan and Morocco and India and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. And the lessons, the way they talk to each other felt like we were all in the same room. So I think that that India has an enorm enormous role to play, both building inward and also um, extending outward and pulling back in. And the tools are now there for us. But we've got to stop thinking of ourselves as singular organizations and really think of ourselves as permeable. And the last thing I'll say is that in ecosystem building, if we've learned one thing, it's that trust is the most precious currency that we have. And that what this this next chapter in history has to be about is building, we can use the word ecosystem and in some ways it's dry. We need to build communities based on shared values that can encompass our diversity and keep showing up and being more willing to share our failures with each other as well as our successes so that we can actually get on with the work that needs to happen. And um, that's what we're doing. Great. Uh, thank, thank you for sharing that, uh, Jacqueline. So, so a couple of things I think that will relate to the conversation later that I kind of took note. One is, uh, you know, building a platform. So, is that a physical kind of platform you're talking about, like a? Uh, no, it's an online set of a, it's, it's about thirty courses okay. um, that people are taking, and then, and then the platform teaches you. So now we're seeing hackathons and the acumen core young people from around the world who will gather to try to solve a problem for a coffee company in Colombia or a, uh, a fellow in Pakistan or, or in India and so uh, it's ever evolving a little bit like Rohini was talking about right. but it's all online and, and it's open and accessible to anyone over all here free or? Yeah, so where should they go if they wanted to get to it? Acumen.org? <laughs> if you just go into acumen.org and look up plus acumen, you'll see the list okay. of courses. Great. So, you know, you have a valuable resource. Acumen has got a lot of, uh, you know, they've done a lot of work in this field. And I'm sure those of you who are just getting started, if you want to kind of connect and find out more, that's a great place to go. So thanks for sharing that. I mean, the other, the other point was trust. So I think, you know, we ought to think about that as we think about, you know, what we, what we we build across borders, uh, you know, within the organization, across organizations, and then uh, you know, the last one was you know the value and margin that you have to drive to when you look at the you know the Indian market, especially uh, that we have over here. So let's keep that also in mind. So let me just switch to uh, Ravi. Ravi, you know, just you know, kind of. Key, uh, taking off on the platform thing, right? I think my, Microsoft, obviously, everybody thinks technology platforms and everything, but you do more than that. Uh, so can you just share what your, uh, you know, particularly your focus and uh, scale and what you're thinking about the future in terms of the role Microsoft can play, especially in this sector as we grow? Yeah, thank you, Raj. Um, yeah, so uh, as you can imagine, Microsoft, uh, uh, looked at technology as a way to enable uh, large-scale impact and, and, and put it out there as, as largely as possible. And we found that it is, it's not something that actually uh, creates the right business models and the right impact. And we, we found that we, the pendulum has to swing to a completely different side and start the journey uh, all the way from the beginning. So actually our journey has been a shorter journey in this, in this particular uh, segment where we started this by saying, why don't we do just a few companies, few startups, and create a deep impact amongst them so that they become the role models for the rest of the ecosystem, and they go out and make this thing happen in a in a in a bigger way. So, we at, at Microsoft for Startups, which is the uh, uh, organization that I am part of. Uh, our mantra is empowering every startup and every entrepreneur on the planet to do more, right? So that's a pretty broad thing. But having said that, just taking maybe 15, 20 startups and creating some insignia, you know, some, uh, you know, some, um, some kind of an impact which is uh, differentiated and create those role models we felt was the best way to go. So we started this in Bangalore. Uh, the first party accelerator. And then, having learned from that, we went and started uh, taking the same curriculum, the same coursework, the same methodologies, the way we would uh, uh, mentor the mentors, 
in, in a way, creating that ecosystem around those accelerators so that they can do more. And, and made this happen in 10 different places. And this is across the board. We did it in FinTech, we did it in Smart City IoT, we did it in uh, Social Entrepreneurship, which is where we are with uh, Deshpande Foundation, and uh, real estate and so on and so forth. So we, uh, so far in the last four years, we have impacted about 1,000 uh, startups. So, uh, you know, maybe 2,000 entrepreneurs in the, in the process. And therefore, those have gone out and impacted the ecosystems around them. And, and we felt that was probably the more interesting way to start you know, the journey rather than the other way around. In fact, I had started uh, almost 10 years ago with uh, my own startup called Mentor Square, which Rajiv was a part of, where we decided to throw an on, uh, technology and hoping that mentoring will happen across the board. Uh, this happens to be the, the exact opposite of that, and we felt that the impact that we're making there is, is much better. And so what happens is we have created this uh, module called an entrepreneurship in a box. And you know there are three different segments where uh, there is this whole thing about actuation. How do you actually go about listening to the needs, to the problems that are out there? How do you identify them without intellectualizing it ahead of time? And if you intellectualize ahead of time, you obviously end up with some business that you mm -hmm. probably shouldn't be at. And 99% of the businesses or the startups fail because of the fact that they have actually you know, brought in their own intellectual understanding, their own constructs to this whole thing. We spend a fair amount of time on that, which you feel is probably a very, very simple thing, but most entrepreneurs fail because they don't necessarily see the, the problem statement clearly enough to actually start working on it. Then obviously we bring in the time-tested methodologies for bu building the right business models, the technology uh, models, and also uh, how do you create the right infrastructure around it so that you are act actually able to monitor the business the right way. So that is the second piece. And the third, of course, is we provide a kind of an exoskeleton, if you will, for these entrepreneurs so that they uh, are, you know, they have a structure around them where they are challenged uh, with uh, answering the right questions. Are they going about it the right way? Are they building the right model? Is it ready for scale? Something that, you know, when you're doing this all by yourself, and people talk about this being a very lonely journey, but if, imagine if, you're if the entrepreneur invites these uh, mentors or these coaches or advisors to come in and create that infrastructure around them and create that rigor around them, they actually are able to monitor the progress in a much more quantitative way, in a more objective way, and actually make something happen onto that. And we actually have done this not just in the for-profit uh, sector in different places, but also in the not-for-profit in Deshpande. So um, I have a colleague called Naveen who actually helps us, you know, in, in actually uh, you know, making this happen in a much larger way in all these places. So he actually brings those kinds of rigors in, in actually making this, uh, the, the, the various uh, accelerator, partner accelerators do this in their own segments. And that's been kind of the model that we have gone about in, in building these uh, uh, accelerator models to bring technology into the startup world uh, and, and, and really make this scale in a much, much significant way. And, and the same uh, thing has been also been adopted by Microsoft Philanthropies as how do we bring in the technologies underneath of uh, a certain uh, market that has been found, a, a certain need that has been found, the right entrepreneurs are in place and they're actually built out the initial prototype of the business model al already. And how do we bring in, you know, sometimes the, the, the financial investors come in and say, okay, now this is the time to put in the, fina the finances so that we can scale it we say, well, let's put in the technology so that we can scale it. And so that's how we have built out these models uh, across India. And this is something that we're looking to uh, now take from India to the rest of the countries that we are in right now. That, that, that's great to know. In fact, I, I, so that kind of ties into what Jacqueline also said, which is, you know, I think India can become the test bed, the incubator for a lot of ideas, then eventually, you know, you can push out to others who are also looking for similar solutions. Uh, the, the stuff that you talked about, uh, you know, within the network that you've built, is there information that is open and accessible? Are people from outside, can they look 
for business advice or mentorship or even just white papers or something to help them? Yeah, so some of this information is, uh, uh, is, is being put together as we speak because this is something that we have been uh, you know, uh, trying to create uh, as a, a white paper at this time. So if, if you get in touch with either Naveen or I, we'll be happy to share that with you. Good. So, you know, people who are thinking about, especially from a technology perspective, I assume, right? Yeah, yeah great. So uh, let me uh, switch uh, gears and kind of, uh, you know, ask uh, Prerna to join the conversation. So Prerna is with uh, the Yes Foundation. She's CEO of that. Uh, and, you know, Yes Bank, a lot of people know of Yes Bank. Uh, and uh, as the, uh, the right hand of uh, the Yes Bank, uh, Prerna and the foundation make sure that they engage with the community out there. And they're doing some very exciting stuff also at scale. So can you just share what you're doing and what are your thoughts in terms of scaling? Sure. Uh, first of all, it's great to be here. And uh, congratulations to Deshpande Foundation. I mean, the work that you all have been doing is just out. It's fabulous. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I represent Yes Foundation, and I had the privilege of setting up the foundation uh, from scratch, and uh, and that was just five years ago. So it gives an advantage to have a look of what's happening around, and uh, as we all rightly agree, there's great work happening in specific areas. Uh, so we thought as to how we can play a role in building the ecosystem. And uh, with minimum resources, uh, one one member team besides two mem two member team besides me. Uh, so we thought, uh, and it uh, it it uh, you know uh, it's like some of what's been going on over the last two days, and what we've expressed here. Uh, if we could focus on youth, as uh, all of us are aware, out of 1.3 billion population, India's population, 52% is youth. So there's a huge potential there. And uh, the thought is even for them to uh, have, uh, get into, start their own enterprises or be involved in the social sector, uh, we cannot really sermonize and patronize to them. It's about, with the youth, we realize that it's about giving them a challenge and uh, for it to be experiential. Uh, and uh, the other thing we thought is how can we really impact uh, non-profits, uh, social enterprises, social impact organizations, and see what we can do to, you know, accelerate or scale up their work. And, uh, and also, when, uh, when I was starting the foundation, I looked at what the strengths as a bank that we could uh, bring to the table. And uh, keeping all this in mind and keeping that, yes, bank is also quite involved in, uh, we are the major funder to Bollywood, uh, uh, we thought that, uh, you know, there's a strong po proposition in storytelling. Mm -hmm. We believe that stories can change the world, and maybe we can change the world one story at a time. So we, we thought, how do we stitch this all up? So we are talking about youth, we are talking about social impact organizations, and we are talking about media. So we came up with an experiment, uh, uh, you know, at that time it was really an experiment, uh, where we said we'll have a social filmmaking challenge. Wherein at 6 o'clock in the morning, if you have registered with us, you'll get a topic and you have 101 hours to make the film. And uh, it started in a small way. Uh, with We had 2,200 participants in 2013. And the last edition, uh, we had 1.3 million participants from 2,500 cities and towns, uh, making it a kind of revolution where youth made it their own movement. And uh, what we thought of as an experiment, uh, luckily for us, uh, the results were great uh, because we found that, you know, when youth make films, they cannot remain passive, you know. You cannot just be a witness. You get involved with the subject. So we had, like, of course, I had, like, thousands of people asking me as to how Yes Foundation could support that, you know, everyday hero or a particular nonprofit. Uh, but we saw, saw a wave happening of people volunteering, of people fundraising, like uh, this girl Sudeshna in Delhi. She had made a film on this lady called Pratima who takes care of 400 dogs, who herself is a rag picker. And uh, somehow the authorities, you know, they demolished her dwellings and all of that. So Sudeshna went on and she did a crowdfunding campaign and she's just 20 years old and collected 2,000 US dollars for her which was really helpful to that lady because they set up a tea stall and she could sell tea, et cetera. 
and two uh, people even starting their own enterprises. So we had uh, this girl, Lena Kejriwal, who set up a campaign called Missing, using art and technology to bring down the number of girls that are trafficked. And uh, so actually, uh, it, it just had a momentum of its own. Now, based on this, we saw a whole series of change makers and social entrepreneurs coming up. So we started a change makers program to support them. And the films that were produced, we have 34,000 three-minute films, are used by the government, government of Maharashtra, government of Chhattisgarh, uh, in, in Maharashtra and 22,500 primary schools uh, to improve the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the learning outcomes, etc. And uh, so after this, uh, we saw that, you know, all of this is happening and it's great. So we said, as we discussed this morning, it's important to provide platforms. So uh, we saw that there are already great fellowships in the country, but there's no undergraduate fellowship. I, I strongly believe that, you know, in the power of uh, positive accidents and uh, being in the sector, uh, it's because of that one particular mentor uh, that I was lucky to have or uh, a particular instance, we are in the sector and then there's no going back. So how do we create these positive accidents? So was, first was through Yes, I'm the Change, and then through the fellowship, uh, where we have uh, fellows that we place with uh, social impact organizations just for two months uh, to work with them on using digital storytelling and to communicate their work. And in this whole process, again, we found that a lot of the fellows, uh, while they came in just for the exposure, now want to join the development sector. But it's not only that we are aiming that, uh, to have leaders for the development sector. Of course, we want leaders of the, for the development sector. But we want people to even go on to become MDs and uh, CFOs with people and planet besides profit in mind. So this is what we're doing uh, for the ecosystem development. Thanks. Wow, that is amazing in just five years. So you said you reach out to one point some five million. One point three million. One point three million uh, people all across uh, yeah. India. That's amazing. And thirty four thousand films. Yeah. So is this available on a platform somewhere? Yes. Is can how do we get to it? Uh, so it, in fact, uh, it's available on a website. And also, I'm going to make a marketing pitch. <laughs> uh, we have this challenge going on. The yes, I'm the cha change challenge that I've talked about. This year, uh, we are asking. Uh, you know, youth to make films on non-profit, social enterprises, everyday heroes. And uh, not only we, will we award the youth, uh, but the top 500 uh, social impact organizations, we'll ask them to send proposals. And uh, we have created a grant plus accelerator support of over uh, $1 million uh, with support for three years uh, for social impact organizations. So yes, foundation not in. Great. So, you know, take a look at that. There's wonderful uh, progress. So, uh, the, the last panelist that we have over here is, uh, you know, Sanjay Potter. And Sanjay has got a foot in both camps in some ways, right? I mean, you come from Accenture, you're part of Accenture Labs, but you're doing uh, also leading their Tech for Good Labs. So, you get to see both worlds. So, Share with us your perspective in terms of a the kinds of people that you come across, the kind of people that you help, and what are you seeing in terms of the work both Accenture is doing as well as uh, beyond that. Thanks, Raj, and thanks for having me in this dialogue. Probably I'm a, a slightly different. Uh, I will bring a slightly different perspective, given that I am actually a researcher. I lead Accenture's research and development. Uh, in India and globally responsible for technology for good, as you uh, rightly mentioned. And um, as a technology researchers, we are very arrogant people. You know, we, if you talk to all these technology people, you will always see that they feel technology will eat the world, right? And uh, in, to some extent, technology is eating the world. Some of the examples we saw, probably Dr. Devi Shetty showed last, uh, yesterday, about Airbnb and Ubers, Uber having no cars, but yet the largest transportation company. Uh, technology is phenomenally uh, changing the way you can solve some of the hard problems faced by man mankind, right? Um, if you look at the sustainable development goals uh, that the United Nations talks about, which, has, which represent some of the hard problems, one thing is very characteristic about each of these areas. These are exponential problems. We, we discussed yesterday 300 million youths to be skilled. 
the big numbers, eight trillion dollar uh, opportunity in healthcare itself, big numbers, and um, you cannot solve exponential problems in a linear way. You need an exponential way to solve this kind of problems, and hence, um, uh, you know, technology plays a very critical role. Ex actually, the ex uh, the new age technologies, whether you talk about the digital technologies, artificial intelligence, blockchain, IoT, and I know many of you f must be feeling a bit uncomfortable as I talk about these terminologies because uh, there is a digital divide in my opinion. On one hand, you go to the World Economic Forum, you read a lot of uh, you know, Facebook feeds, you see all these big names, big technologies that is going to phenomenally disrupt the world. On the other hand, you know, I'm sure many of you uh, from the civil society, the non-profits who are here, who are in those rural areas, the dusty areas, you know, it's a total disconnect where the problem is. You know, the, there's on one hand the problem, and you try to figure out how is all this technology is really going to impact and solve my problems, right? And, and in my opinion, this is uh, not, not as intuitive, okay? Uh, from a lab perspective, when we run the Tech for Good program, that's a problem we want to solve. We want to make these technologies real. So uh, we, we, in some sense, entered this whole thing about four or five years back, and just by chance, when we tried to help some nonprofit in the east of the country to put, prevent human trafficking. And uh, we could find the community workers in the very, very rural villages with uh, the pencil and a paper in hand, collecting data, uh, trying to figure out who are the vulnerable girls, for example. And for the first time, we arm them with solutions which work around with data science, right? How do you use data to figure out which girl child is more vulnerable and you need to prioritize so that she doesn't become a victim of early marriage or school dropout or the worst case, human traffic. And uh, you know, fortunately, our solution was impactful. It saved in the first year 200 girl child. We won some awards. And then it got us thinking that, hey, we are helping businesses, large businesses every day. But these technologies have such immense power. They can bring about societal transformation. Right? And, and just by chance, the Tech for Good program was born. Uh, I heard Jacqueline talk about uh, the uh, razor thin margins you have to operate and create a big impact. And uh, Deshpande Foundation, in a lot of sense, is the crucible of Akshay Patra. So, when I was uh, last year around this time talking to Akshay Patra, for example, the CEO, uh, Venkat, Shridhar Venkat, he says, Sanjay, every paise you can uh, reduce from the cost of a meal, I can feed 4,200 more children. So, so th that's the kind of now, if you want to bring that kind of transformation, you have to bring the new age technologies. And we, we kind of enabled three of the kitchens in Bangalore, and we could demonstrate to them how they can have 18% productivity improvement and feed millions of more children, right? So the, la the work that my lab does is demystify all this new age technology. Like blockchain, I'm working in the coffee board scenario, coffee scenario, how do you, uh, empower the small holding farmers? How do you build a network of trust? So, so my day job is largely helping the global clients that we have. You know, we are, we are a huge organization. But, but uh, the tech for good that I lead is all about demystifying all this new technology. Uh, we are using emotional AI, for example, <laughs> just to make sure uh, the, the rural uh, uh, women, we can understand the friction in the mind and help them to take decision to take microfinance with one of the l biggest name in the industry. So uh, we are tech advisors, and all this is pro bono, by the way. So we are tech advisors to a lot of nonprofits. And it, it kind of caught up like a movement, and then Accenture said, let's do it globally. So now I globally lead this program across all continents. But that's not all that we do. We also have large transformational projects, which in our biggest focus is skilling, uh, because we are ourselves half a million strong around the globe, and we work in 40 industries. So we have to skill half a million people every year. So we know how to do talent transformation. And so what we are really targeting on is, from 2010, we have launched a program to skill uh, 3 million people so that they can get a job by 2020. 
And we have, uh, glad to say we have already reached a target of 1.7 million. We have achieved that. Uh, what we really bring to the table of two things, our, our ability to do large scale talent transformation. And the second is given we are such large and global, the ability to create the ecosystem, right? So those are some of the flagship things we do. Uh, this year I was uh, selected as an Eisenhower Fellow and that brought me to, close to Desh when I visited him in Boston. And I was, my, my research hypothesis was uh, starting from the initial point I made that technology, the combinatorial power of technology will uh, be a great boost to transform the society. But somewhere I figured out that it was not enough based on all the, you know, some of the examples I shared. I thought there's another combinatorial power at play and that's the combinatorial power of the ecosystem or Jacqueline would say the combinatorial power of the community, right? So when you bring the collective intelligence of the community, the shared goals, you bring in all those uh, system leadership that we are talking about, I think that in, in addition to the combinatorial power of technology will help us accelerate social transformation. The last point I want to make though is, uh, make here is two. One is what's in it for the business? It's very important because you know, this is not some party we are having, right? All the stakeholders need to have something in it. And uh, if you look at uh, what the United Nations really proposed that if you solve some of these hard problems, you are talking about $12 trillion additional market value by 2030 and 377 million jobs. So it makes a lot of sense for corporates and business to start solving for the next billion, number one. Number two is uh, going to the point that Desh made um, about you know, the capacity to absorb innovation on the ground. I think that's one, one big challenge for us because I believe that all the nonprofits, all the social innovators, you have to start thinking to build yourself as digital organizations. You need to have skills to handle data. You need to safeguard the data. You need to have digital ethics in place. Uh, it's not that easy, but you know, that's, that's where the ecosystem can come to play. It's not enough just building platforms. You, you need to have all the digital ethics and skills to play. So, you know, it's, it's a, and that's another area where we are working. We are trying to educate Great. the nonprofits. So long answer, sorry, Thanks. but no, that's no, no. the spectrum I, of work. I see Jacqueline is eager to I'm respond. just going crazy. So, yeah, please. <laughs> I love what you said. And there's a, uh, just a couple things that, because I think that what you, what you talked about that's so important as we think about the blockchain and radical transparency that we're starting to see around the world. There, there, there's huge opportunities, but it takes a complete, a radical mind shift. And sometimes I think we, the, we have the, there's a risk that corporations want to say to the nonprofits, if you could be more like businesses, things would be better. This is also a moment in history where the corporations need to learn from the nonprofits. And, and, and we have to have that humility that goes b both ways because the, I'm really exhausted by this idea that doing well by doing good, because that is trite, frankly. Um, corporations no longer can hire the next generation of millennials unless they're truly sustainable and they're serious about it. And so there's huge opportunity. And, and exactly what you said, we've got companies in Bahawalpur, uh, in the southern Punjab and Pakistan, the epicenter of extremist um, ideology, uh, trying to help farmers get out of feudal bondage. And then we've got kids in Bogota, Colombia, who are using the blockchain so that they can actually bring value to exactly at the micro lot what the, 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 the coffee farmer is giving to the, um, to the supply chain. And, and the opportunity of community is helping both sides see what they might be able to do. But I think that there's enormous opportunity in this, in this moment, because we're seeing in the coffee industry, which you talked about, particularly in Colombia, where there's a generation of entrepreneurs that are ignoring global commodity prices altogether. They have the insight that the premium coffee buyers who are paying $5 for a cappuccino at, name the company, want to know who the farmer um, is that grew that coffee at the micro lot. And when they understand it, they're willing sometimes to even put extra money in 
so that it goes to that farmer. And so this one-to-one -one relationship is something also that we need to be thinking about it as part of the ecosystem. And then also, how do we build the trust that goes not only corporation, which are so critical for scale, um, but also the phila individual philanthropists. So two young guys in India that are, are Acumen Fellows um, could do anything in the world, but they want to work with the farmers in Andhra who are too often committing suicide with what Rohini talked about, the lack of water. And so they've come up with a, a greenhouse in a box, to use your language, and um, it takes 1 16th of an acre. And we're, wa we're seeing farmers in very, very arid areas uh, double their full income with a two-year two payback period for the greenhouse in a box. Because we've been able to help network them, they are fully not lonely nor isolated because they've got their other fellows. They've got individual philanthropists from Sweden and the United States and India that are supporting them and finding them, connecting them to Israel, tech Israel's technology. And I think that we've got to get out of the even sectoral mindset and really look at all the different players that want to make change. And that's the key, that it shouldn't matter if you're a corporate or you're an individual or you're a social entrepreneur or you're a nonprofit. It's finding what you said, Raj. Can we be really honest about what we need from the relationship and what we're all trying to solve? Still not easy, but I think it's the only way we do it. So I just, I've just so enjoyed hearing what everyone has said because I think this is really a panel of kind of deep agreement. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, even though you all are from different fields, I, there's a lot of commonalities. And, yeah, it, it, the, the question of trust is obviously one of them. I think the other one is of culture, too, right? So uh, uh, as you work across cultures, how do you bridge that? And especially when you want to scale, right? Uh, so uh, it's okay when you're working in a region or in a country, but uh, you, you, you just mentioned mentoring from Finland and having people working over here. How, how do you build culture into the whole ecosystem so that you're both, uh, you know, you're sensitive about the culture at the same time you address it as you scale. Uh, so I think trust and culture in some cases are more important than, you know, the technology underlying it. Uh, so uh, I'd like to, you know, open it up to the audience. Uh, we have maybe another 10 minutes or so. Uh, if there are questions in the audience, uh, you know, feel free. Uh, raise your hands. I think there are some microphones around. Uh, while you're thinking about the questions, let me just ask one last question uh, across the board. Uh, where does, uh, you know, somebody who's out there trying to build an ecosystem, either locally or otherwise, uh, where do they look for support in terms of financing? Where do you find the money? Who is there? I know we have, you know, CSR programs and stuff like that. How do they get started? Where do you see, you know, uh, are the big corporations your partners? Or where do they look? Uh, how do you build an ecosystem without the resources, uh, you know, it, both financial and otherwise? I, I, I'm talking too much, but we have to raise every dollar that we invest. So um, my whole life is spent thinking about money, which I wish it weren't. But um, from an eco sector perspective, from an ecosystem perspective, and given that we have corporations on this stage, one of the most important contributions that corporations have made to our efforts have been to um, sponsor gatherings, not only for social entrepreneurs, but for other corporations. As we speak, there's one happening in Nairobi that's bringing together 90 players, probably 30 different corporate um, corporations are represented there with companies that we've supported and um, our hope and my expectation because we've done this before is that relationships form where it makes sense the money starts to flow um, but it's not just money this idea of using supply chains is a really big p and technical assistance uh, but so I think that what, what you guys are doing with Deshpandi Corporations could do more of it because it's, they've got pockets of money for this to bring these gatherings together. Yes, I think uh, ecosystems are seeded not by money, seeded by passion. As somebody who has actually gone out, found something to work upon, uh, and therefore gathered other people equally passionate, equally driven, equally committed to making that happen. 
to be the beginnings of something that actually needs to be backed up by money or by technology or other resources. So that, that's the way we have uh, found uh, places to actually go work with. And of course, we, we have done this at, at a even macro level where we actually funded those accelerators to actually work with them and, and make this thing happen. So we feel that this is, uh, you know, the, the, when we work with individual entrepreneurs, they say, you know, just give me the money, I'll figure it out. We're saying, you, you tell us what, what is it that you're going to build, uh, show that it actually worked with your first two, three uh, stakeholders, and then we'll come and, you know, back. The money will come, I mean, money will follow. It's only that you need to tell us what that little uh, microcosm that you've already created, that you can now build it into an ecosystem. So I agree with what you're saying, and I think it's more about uh, you know understanding yourself first to say that this is the value I'm going to bring to the table, and then look for specific organizations that you resonate with. Uh, because while we are saying that we have corporate CSR funding, uh, CSR funding is limiting in terms of uh, as per the act, each cor corporation has to define that this is my focus area and I'm working in only this focus area. So it makes sense to see, uh, you know, uh, what is your core competency and then align. And as Jacqueline said, then if you're part of particular ecosystems, then you can get more out of that ecosystem. So even in the fund that we have set up, uh, while we have set up a fund of, a fund of $1 million, we are looking at matching funds, we are looking at getting our expertise to the table. Uh, we have a fintech accelerator by Yes Bank, and there we are not really looking at giving money, uh, but uh, through the accelerator, uh, getting the entrepreneurs access to you know our problems and our teams and working side by side uh, with the specific team to solve a problem. Yeah, thanks. Can I just answer the point? Yeah. I'd like to give an example on uh, ecosystem building from a perspective of an entrepreneur. Uh, one of the entrepreneurs we work closely with is a company called uh, Reverie Language Technologies. They are attacking the problem of the Indian language internet because 90% of India does not speak English, but the internet speaks only English. So when they started out seven or eight years ago, they were a bootstrap startup. They had great ideas in technology, but obviously resources were a problem. So there are two, three things that they used. One is to use the power of other people's channels. So you kind of create a good product, and then you work along with influence at least one or two smartphone companies and try and embed your product into their system. And that provided them a certain amount of reach. The second is to work on standards. A lot of markets get created if regulations can be influenced. So working very closely at an industry association and starting to get Indian language standards made mandatory for phones. And that again provided a big problem. And third is to find out a bunch of people who, are, who have the cause of the Indian language internet and getting them on board as mentors and advisors. So it's, some of these have worked quite well. So where, where are they right now in, in their stage of growth? Well, right now, uh, their, their system is probably there on close to around 400 million phones. And Indian language um, uh, technology has become mandatory for all the future phones in the country. That's great. Great. Thanks. Uh, is there questions out there? I, uh, can you, wh whoever's got the mi mic, just and let's keep the questions to the point uh, on the topic of uh, what's on the board, uh, uh, on the panel. Thanks. Yeah, my question is to Yes Bank uh, representative. We are just, uh, you have talked about the 2% of CSR and its allocation and its impact. But as you know, banking has been given another responsibility of sticking to uh, priority lending. 16% of your total lending should be focused on the priority, where the impact would have been much bigger than what is the impact which is being created out of this 2% allocation. And of late, sanitation has also included in the priority sector lending. So what is the policy and how the bank is performing in respect to the investment in the priority sector lending, and what is the impact it has created so far? Uh, right. So as you are aware, even priority sector lending is mandatory. So Yes Bank also fulfills its priority sector, uh, sector lending uh, responsibilities. And there's a huge impact on, uh, especially on agri and farmers through that. Uh, so, uh, also to add another point to what you're saying, uh, you know, Yes Bank believes that uh, 
no doubt, uh, you know, we have to contribute to the country. Uh, but first, we have a big responsibility as a lender to see where funds are directed in the economy. So we even follow, uh, you know, uh, 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 the ESG principles of seeing that the f uh, projects that we fund uh, ensure that they do not damage or they are pro-society and environment. So, uh, so we do take uh, the uh, responsibility of being a good corporation first, right from uh, looking at fulfilling our priority sector lending requirements to seeing that our house is, is in order as a director of funds in the economy. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Another question, they had a ha hand out there. Uh, yeah, I follow up on the same question again. Um, priority sector or not, it's retail lending which is going to make the difference, which is um, uh, can, a, a can lot Can you just keep these questions a little broader than just having one person talk about yes, a specific... Yes, it is, it is act actually applicable to everyone. Okay. Um, we're building a, a, a platform called Trainees, uh, which is occupational network uh, for existing and aspirational occupational groups. Now, a big part of the stickiness for that kind of community building is access to funds. Access to funds at a retail level, we're talking about 30,000 rupees to well, one and a half lakh rupees. Now, we've been approaching uh, small finance banks to, to partner with us to provide that to the communities, but you still have the same process which is intimidating for the retail borrower. Where and how do we uh, achieve this kind of ability to uh, reach these small uh, uh, borrowers when all we have and what we're building is a reputation engine which will provide a community uh, backing of, of so, so, uh, so let's this. take that question offline okay because I think it's very specific it's not something that 90% of our panel can answer other than prerna uh, is there anything more general that we can we have a lady out there at the back hi thank you guys very much we're from New Brunswick Canada so we've learned a lot from everybody in this room um, I have two questions. Um, talking about the gatherings, the large gatherings sponsored by um, corporations, what are the, have you found that there are common characteristics in these corporations um, being the leader to start those gatherings and what are they and, and what are they buying into? Um, is it strength in numbers and the common goal that they're trying to achieve? How do you find that in you know, your own ecosystem, for example? What do you look for? So when you look at a, um, a GE or Unilever, they know how to scale. And, um, and really to Ravi's point that they also recognize that um, in this next generation, they must understand how to get to the next billion. And so their recognition is that what they're great at is scale, what they're not as great at is innovation, certainly for low income groups. Um, what organizations like ours are good at in Dishpande Foundation, we actually know how to get innovation moving um, in those markets. So what they're looking for are who are the next innovators that actually have a sustainable, viable, scalable company and what can they learn from it. And so they're actually willing to partner, um, frankly, for you know, in some of these cases, we've been working with corporations for 10, 15 years because of the lessons that they are learning. So Unilever, at one of the gatherings, which they help sponsor, and usually we get multiple sponsors, um, saw a cook, stone, cook stove company in uh, Kenya. Unilever has made a, a commitment to sustainability across its supply chain, recognizing that tea, Lipton tea is one of their products, and people use cook stoves to boil the water for that tea. And so they feel a responsibility to reduce that environmental footprint. We have a, a, a highly viable cook stove company that reduces charcoal consumption by 50% immediately, as well as wood. Um, and so we've now built, they, those two, all we had to do was be the merit all. It was not so easy, but all, the, what we could do is create the, the environment where the marriage could be created so that Burn plus Unilever could create a joint venture to build a new co-branded stove 
um, for farmers in the tea plantations that Unilever is uh, sourcing its tea from across East Africa. That's a real tangible victory that can come out of these kinds of gatherings. And so everyone there knows why they're there. They're, they're, there's a huge level of openness. And because we do them year after year, the same players usually show up. Um, corporations might change. But um, it's a, this is where I keep thinking, this is about relationship and even friendship. Uh, but we have to break down these barriers of mistrust that too often exist between all of the different sectors. So, yes, sir, a couple Hi. Um, we call them summits. Um, you might have a better word for it, but right now they're called summit or collaboration gatherings. They're different. Well, they're different. So the energy, um, because we've got IKEA and other major players that are supporting our pioneer energy work, they, it's been in their interest to essentially, one, be seen in the world as pushing a clean energy agenda. Um, two, uh, help us build out the ecosystem beyond Acumen. And so they supported us in London to bring together um, foundations, our companies, corporations. Um, and it was really about um, bare bones learning. I think we spoke, we focus more on failures as including how hard it is for social enterprises to work with corporations often because of different language, different expectations, different level of scale, uh, players that change. Uh, you might convince the head of supply chain finally for you know, why this, this makes sense and then they move. So we got to talk about all of that in a very safe space. So really strong facilitators. The one that's happening in Kenya is more players that have been in that specific space more with each other. Um, but we're starting to do more of these around the world. And um, I frankly would love to see more of them in India um, because I think that you're going to... <laughs> done! Hi. Because <laughs> I Hi think there, it's so I, powerful. Can I just... That's exactly what we're looking for, is collaborations like that to happen. So yeah, thank, thanks for <laughs> making the connection. Uh, and in fact, yeah. the others on the stage... Yeah, I maybe I, I, want, I want to add something. In the coming week, in this week itself, you know, uh, Accenture Labs and Stanford, we are a civil society lab. We have tied up and we are bringing, we are doing a, a conference called Digital Impact uh, Data from Possibilities to Responsibility in Mumbai, where we are actually uh, coaching or mentoring over 200 nonprofits on how they become a digital organization. What do they have to watch out for, right? So many such things uh, we bring to the table. Yeah, no, absolutely. So in fact, when you gave those examples, I think those are great examples where you know you know what the value is from the technology side. A lot of nonprofits are running 100 percent, you know, flat out, and they don't have the bandwidth to sit down and think about the technology. So having someone like you look at their problems and say, "Hey, this is where you can help in your trust value chain or wherever," right? Uh, it helps them at least jumpstart what they're doing. So it's great that you're doing it. And if we can create these congregations where we bring both sides of the yeah, equation yeah. together, I think you know it helps everyone. Uh, one yeah, last question. I, I, so. I, can I have the last question, please? Who is, who is yeah, that? I'm architect Neela Manjunath, and uh, I've been working in the green building sector, sustainable building sector for the last 30 years. And uh, we have been talking about energy. I think energy which goes into the buildings, we are always in buildings one type of the other. They produce more than 60% of the pollution in the world, anywhere. And I'm just wondering if there's any uh, corporation or any, by any organization which funds killing and awareness building in this green building movement. So that's what I'm, that's what is my question. Okay. That, that's a very specific question. I don't know, does anyone on the panel have any inputs on that? Or, uh, so, uh, you know, it's a specific question. Maybe there are others in the audience who might be able to answer it. So let's, uh, you know, take it offline. So one last question that is more general as opposed to specific. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Prasad Joshi. Uh, actually, I don't have a question, but I would like to emphasize on uh, what Sanjay Let, sir said. 
Uh, Let, let's keep it to a question. This is relevant to the topic. We have precious sir. little this time. This is relevant to the topic and I'll take just one minute. Uh, Sanjay sir mentioned that uh, uh, non-profit organizations have to focus on uh, digitization uh, in their work and uh, do data analytics to uh, bring out uh, uh, the, uh, you know, um, insights from their data. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's a good point and uh, you have been in this uh, for uh, a decade or few years at least and then somebody rightly said that you can only connect the dots by looking backwards. So, uh, data analysis can re really help you do that and bring insight from your data that you have collected in case it is in the form of uh, digital. So, we are a data analytics company situated in this particular campus and we are ready to uh, offer help in that region. Uh, area. Awesome. Th thanks. And what's your name and uh, organization again? I am uh, Prasad Joshi. Uh, we are a data analytics company named Data Sattva. Data? Sattva. Okay. We, we bring out the true essence of data. That's right. why Sattva. All right. Thank With you. that, let me uh, you know thank our panel uh, for taking the time and joining us. Uh,